Hello again and welcome to the continuing series of debunking the claims in Eric Dubay's video 200 Proofs Earth is not a spinning ball. In the first episode we have looked at the horizon, the amount of curvature we would expect to see and looked at some instances where such curvature was actually observable. As others have remarked, the observation that the horizon is apparently flat are among the best arguments for a flat Earth and comparatively hard to refute, since it takes some effort to actually see and measure the curvature. But as we progress through the video, it starts getting a bit strange, and assertions are thrown about without even the slightest shred of evidence to support them. The next ones are really quite surreal. Let's take a look. 3. The natural physics of water is to find and maintain its level. The natural physics of water. So what is that? Is there a natural physics of water? Supernatural maybe? It finds and maintains its level? What does that mean? I have really no idea what he's talking about. I think we need a small refresher course in elementary mechanics. Water between roughly 0 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees at normal atmospheric pressure is a liquid. It has mass. That means it is attracted by other objects with mass. The largest gravitational force we experience is Earth's, by many orders of magnitude. This whole proof is a typical argument from incredulity. I always see water being flat, as far as I can measure, so I cannot imagine that it can ever be anything other than flat, and so Earth must also be completely and totally flat. The first problem with this is that water always finds its level is just an assertion, and it doesn't really mean anything for water to find something. For large bodies of water, the predominant force is gravity. All water is pulled towards the center of the Earth. Wherever some of it is higher than its surroundings, it will move around so that it eventually comes to rest in a position of lowest energy. On everyday scales, that normally means a flat and level surface. But on small and very small scales, such as tiny drops or water in narrow capillaries, water appears to defy gravity. Tiny drops in the air, commonly known as fog, take a very long time to sink because their mass is so low and air resistance is comparatively high. In capillaries, adhesion between the vessel and the liquid will pull the surface upwards near the edges. If Earth were a giant sphere tilted, wobbling and hurtling through infinite space, then truly flat, consistently level surfaces would not exist here. This bit in Mr. Dubay's so-called proof, it is hard to call it that with a straight face, about tilting and wobbling is just there to confuse us. Suffice it to say for now that the acceleration we experience from the rotation of the Earth, which takes a day to complete, is tiny. Any forces from the Earth's axis precession and nutation, the wobbling, is much smaller still. All of these cycles with amplitudes worth mentioning take months or years to complete. We can safely ignore them. I may make some calculations on the relative scale of forces in a separate video. What are consistently level surfaces anyway? How level is level? What is consistent here? Normally we would take consistent to mean not self-contradictory, but we will run into a slight problem with that, as we shall see. But since Earth is in fact an extended flat plane, this fundamental physical property of fluids finding and remaining level is consistent with experience and common sense. Breaking it down, this is a simple non sequitur. The argument seems to go something like this. Water on small scales appears flat. And since water on large scales being completely flat is consistent with the Earth being flat, the Earth is flat. To see the problem with this extrapolation, we will take a look at how much curvature there is on small water surfaces. Let's take a pool of 50 meters length and try to measure the flatness of the surface. How precise can we measure that? 
Perhaps we can try shining a laser beam across its surface. And on a calm day, maybe we can measure it to a precision of 0.1 millimeters. We would probably find it to be completely flat within our measuring precision. But we cannot then just go along and say, we cannot measure any bulge, therefore we know that all water anywhere will always be absolutely flat. It could still be that it would be curved below our measurement threshold, or that it would be curved over much longer distances. So let's see what kind of bulge we would expect in such a 50 meter pool on an Earth with a 6,371 kilometer radius. The math works out to the water surface at the center of the pool being 0 0.000049 meters higher than at the edges. That is 49 micrometers, or less than a twentieth of a millimeter. It is undetectable by the unaided eye, and we could not hope to measure it in a real-world swimming pool, although we probably could in a tightly controlled lab environment. In a two-meter bathtub, the water level would be 0 0.0000008 meters, or 18 nanometers, higher in the center. In an experimental apparatus of around 10 centimeters, the bulge would be around 0 0.2 nanometers, or about the size of a single water molecule. That is, for all intents and purposes, undetectable. So yes, in real life, when we have to deal with water, we can assume its surface to be absolutely flat, do very precise calculations with that assumption, and not introduce any error worth worrying about. But as so often, it is a matter of scale, and when we are dealing with longer distances, we cannot extrapolate, and at scales of many kilometers, we often need to take the curvature into account. In summary, for small scales, the behavior of water is consistent with a flat Earth, as well as with a large spherical Earth. For larger scales, however, as we have seen in part one, we detect a curvature which is very well explained by a spherical model and contradicts a flat Earth model. That's it for today. I was originally going to cover the so-called proofs 4 and 5 in this video as well, but seeing as it has already taken me almost 8 minutes just to deal with number 3, I will call it a day and get this one out before the holidays. Proofs 4 and 5 are the same thing, so I will certainly deal with both together in the next installment. They are really mind-boggling, and I'll use them as an excuse for a short excursion into gravity. What it is, what it does, how we know its strength, and why it was not invented to explain why we are not flung off the earth from centrifugal forces, etc. So, happy holidays, and see you next time. I will be on the Chaos Communication Congress in Hamburg, helping with a simultaneous translation of the talks, so send me a message if you'd like to meet. Zero Evidence is licensed under a Creative Commons license, attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, 4.0 international.